A branch of service was the U.S. Marine Corps. I served in World War II in combat, and I served during the Korean War. Uh, my highest rank achieved was Major. Interviewers are Scotty Springston, Don Byers, and Carrie Wren. Okay, George, we certainly thank you for coming and meeting with us today. We've started each of these interviews off by asking for any memories you have of the events of, the events of December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. Since that's yeah. the defining moment of World War II, we've asked all of our World War II veterans to start with that. Mm -hmm. Just tell us what you remember. I was uh, located in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, at, uh, on the outskirts of Kitty Vitty Lake. Uh, I was working for Newfoundland base contractors who were working under contract with the U.S. Army. We were building an Army base at that location, Fort Pepperell. It has since become an Air Force base. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's still active or not. Uh, in addition to building the base, we installed quite a few radar installations along the coast of Newfoundland to detect uh, German submarines. Uh, I was uh, eating evening dinner in the mess hall, the contractor's mess hall, where they had a public address system, the radio, and uh, all of a sudden we heard the music interrupted and it was the President Franklin D. Roosevelt announcing that we were at war with Japan and that they had attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, do you remember how you reacted and how your friends reacted? Well, some of us had been sort of expecting something like that uh, since we had uh, been helping uh, Britain out with the transfer of destroyers, 50 destroyers, and we knew that we were being drawn into the war exactly how we didn't know. So it was a surprise uh, in that regard. The biggest surprise, I think, to me was that we had such enormous, uh, suffered such enormous casualties and uh, that we were, ta that our security was so poor. That was the biggest surprise to me. Uh, and of course, then we all discussed uh, fellows my age, actually I was sort of the younger group at the, and this uh, contractors group, most of them were middle-aged men, uh, been in construction all their lives. And uh, so uh, we were concerned about the draft when we were going back to the States, what branch of the service we might want to go into. And uh, we thought about that for a while and uh, I, the. Uh, we were building a marine barracks in Argentia, Newfoundland, which was 90 miles from St. John's. And uh, the barracks was completed in uh, the spring of 42. And uh, so I took a few days off and uh, went by train to Argentia and uh, went to the marine barracks and tried to enlist in the Marine Corps. Well, they couldn't do it for two reasons. They didn't have the authority to enlist anybody there. And second, I was under a year contract with the Army, and I hadn't been released from that. So I had to come back to Newfoundland and uh, to St. John's, and uh, I was released by the Army in, uh, I think it was uh, October, November of 42. And when I got back to the States, I hadn't uh, si uh, signed up for the draft yet because I was underage when I went up there. And uh, I had 30 days to uh, meet my draft board and sign into that. And so I thought, well, I'll enlist before they get a chance to <laughs> get me in the draft. So I went downtown New York City and uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps. So when did you actually go into active duty? In December 42. December 42. Okay. What kind of training did it give you? Where did they train you? How did you train? From New York, uh, we 
gathered a bunch of uh, young men from the city. Uh, There's about 20 of them. And uh, they were all younger than me. And I was put in charge of them. And we were given train tickets to Paris Island. <laughs> and uh, that was quite an ex uh, experience that I enjoyed a lot because most of these young fellows were new lower east side uh, Manhattan New Yorkers <laughs> and tough as nails <laughs> and uh, we had a, a good trip down there and uh, they behaved themselves very well and uh, the Marine Corps met us at Yamasee, South Carolina and took us by bus to Paris Island and then we went through I can't remember whether it was eight or ten weeks of boot camp do you remember when the Marine Corps guy first met you when you stepped off the bus? That's a whole oh, transition. Oh, yeah. He was a, a drill sergeant, drill instructor. And, uh, of course, he uh, uh, immediately uh, started uh, in a way he kind of overwhelmed most of them. But I, I expected it because I had had military training. I'd had it uh, two years at the Citadel. Military College of South Carolina before I went with the uh, uh, Army contractors and uh, so it wasn't I, I, I knew that was going to happen and uh, so we just were uh, went through the regular training program. So how long uh, did it take you at Paris Island? Well I think we were eight or ten weeks I'm not sure what it was and it might have been shortened to eight I'm not I'm not sure that. Well what did you do after that? Well, after that, I was an honor graduate in my platoon since I knew so much about the military that the rest of them didn't know. Uh, so it was easy for me to do it. Paris Island was, uh, was kind, of, kind of fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, several of us were picked to go to a new infantry training regiment in Camp Lejeune. And uh, we were supposed to go through a 10-week program there and it was run by uh, Colonel Lieutenant Colonel Justice Chambers who had just come back from uh, Guadalcanal where he'd been severely wounded spent some time in the hospital and uh, he was out of the hospital and they put him in charge of this infantry training regiment and uh, um, and several of the officers and NCOs were combat veterans who'd been wounded and put out of the hospital, uh, they were put in charge. And uh, we went through about 12 weeks of uh, intensive training. We're in the field all the time. We came back to the barracks on the weekends. And we went out Monday morning, it's a 20-mile hike, somewhere in the field, and we were out until Friday evening. We came back Friday evening, had inspection Saturday morning, and then we had liberty until midnight Sunday night. And uh, that was, we had uh, wonderful training exercises there. Uh, live fire training, uh, creeping and crawling under live machine gun fire and uh, rifle fire and explosives. In fact, that's where I, <laughs> I think I got my first wound, <laughs> friendly fire. <laughs> it had an explosion, a, a rock came up and hit me right in the cheek. <laughs> they didn't give you a purple heart. They didn't get a purple heart for that. Heart for no. that. So, uh, after and this, where did you go? Well, those of us that made it were selected for Officer Candidate School at Quantico. Okay. And I went through that from, I think, uh, around, I think I finished Officer Candidate School in May, around this time of year. And then we had to go through 10 weeks of Officer's Basic School. Okay. So actually, the whole officer training part was an 18-week program. Uh, as officer candidates, we were PFCs, and in officer basic school, we were all second lieutenants. Mm -hmm. And then we were assigned from there, and uh, we were given the opportunity to choose what branch of the uh, Marine Corps we wanted to be in. Some went artillery, some communications. I uh, 
I'm not sure why at this point, but I, I put down infantry. So, it was, being a rifle platoon leader was the height of my expectations at that time. Mm -hmm. So, did you what, did you get assigned to overseas yes, at that time? From there, we went to uh, Camp Le back to Camp Lejeune to a replacement battalion, and uh, we uh, embarked uh, in. I think it was December of 43, uh, here in Norfolk at the Naval Base. Uh, and I, I think I mentioned the, it was the SS Extavia, which was a, a United Fruit Liner that had been turned over to the government for the duration. And uh, all it had carried up till that time had been bananas. <laughs> it was a banana boat from Central America. and. Uh, they uh, installed uh, racks for the troops and racks for the officers in another location. And uh, they unfortunately just welded them together, and which was unfortunate because they all fell apart later. <laughs> Not all of them, but a good portion of them did. And uh, we uh, embarked here and took off for New Caledonia. We went down through the Caribbean between Haiti and Cuba and uh, we had destroyer, two destroyer escorts. German submarines were still pretty active in the Caribbean at that time. And uh, of course we were blacked out and it was nice, very comfortable aboard the ship when we embarked because it was snowing here in Norfolk at that time. And uh, but of course as soon as we got down to the Caribbean it began to get hot and uh, there's no air conditioning or anything. We were all blacked out, buttoned up and it became a pretty hot <laughs> climate in, in, on the ship. And we got about halfway across the Caribbean and one of the boilers blew up and uh, lit up the whole sky. And the destroyer escorts took off, I don't know where they went. And we didn't see them again. <laughs> we limped into uh, the Panama Canal on one boiler and uh, we stayed in the anchorage at Panama City uh, for about three days while they repaired the boiler. And then we took off from there for New Caledonia. We went south of uh, Hawaii, way south of Hawaii, and south of the uh, Samoan, Samoan Fiji Islands. But uh, just about before we got south of the Samoa Islands, we ran into a hurricane. And uh, the hurricane uh, managed to take off all the lifeboats off the ship, uh, all the pontoon life, life rafts that they used to tie onto the sides of the ships in those days. We didn't have a single life raft or a single lifeboat left on the ship. And uh, the boiler blew out again. And uh, the skipper managed to keep four knots headway into a hurricane force wind and by keeping four knots on the ship going ahead, we were going backwards about 12 knots. But he managed to keep the bow into the wind so that we didn't broach. And we would have been flipped right over if we had. And uh, so we got to New Caledonia about 31, 32 days later. Did you have destroyer escort all the way? Or no, no, we had no escort. You all. were by yourself? By ourselves, yeah. Okay. After Panama, there was nothing. Well, after the destroyers left us, the Caribbean, we never saw any destroyers again. Hmm. <laughs> so you went to New Caledonia, that's your first yeah. stop, right? New, New Maya, New Caledonia. And where is that in relationship to, to, say, the Philippines or Guam? Oh, it's, gosh, uh, 1,800, 2,000 miles, I guess, from there. South. Uh, Caledon New Caledonia southeast. is off the south, northeast coast of Australia. Okay. What did you do when you got to New Caledonia? Uh, we were uh, assigned to a camp, uh, and we became part of the part of the First Marine Amphibious Corps. And uh, at this camp, why we were supposed to get our assignments to First Marine Division or uh, Second, Third, whatever divisions were out in the Pacific. Most of us were assigned to the First Marine Division. 
My assignment was held up for about two months because they had a company of construction battalion troops come in, CBs, Navy CBs, and they had not received any military training of any kind uh, except uh, to uh, forward march, halt, left, right face. That's about all they had. And uh, uh, they wanted to give them uh, uh, about eight weeks of uh, military uh, close order drill and field tactics, company field, platoon and company field tactics. So I was made a company commander of the, of the uh, CV company and uh, gave them two months of, of uh, basic military training, mm -hmm. which was a, a very nice experience. I enjoyed it a lot mm -hmm. because I was used to the construction sure. type people. I'd worked with them and uh, we got along great and had a wonderful time. Well, that, while you were there, did they prepare you to invade a specific island or was that just? No, it was just general, just general tactical training, training, right? And I was assigned to the 1st Marine Division from there. So what happened after that? I got transportation to the 1st Marine Division, which was, had just left uh, New Gloucester, or New Britain, and Bougainville. And uh, had, they'd been billeted at uh, Pavuvu, an island of Pavuvu, which is about 60 miles north of, of uh, uh, Guadalcanal. And uh, I've seen it described as a rat-infested mud hole. <laughs> and, uh, that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> and uh, I got air transportation to Pavuvu. I had to go to Guadalcanal first, I believe. Then we took a, I can't, I think I went by landing craft from Guadalcanal up to Pavuvu. And, uh, they just had a small strip at Pavuvu for uh, Piper Cub type aircraft. And uh, I checked into the division. The adjutant assigned me to the 1st Marines, 1st Marine Regiment. Uh, was commanded at that time by Lieutenant Colonel Puller, uh, known as Chesty Puller. And uh, I reported to the adjutant of the 1st Marine Regiment, and he said the, the colonel wants to see you, and he interviews every new officer who comes in. So I said, well, where do I find the colonel? He said, well, he's in that tent right over there. So I went over, and he was asleep. <laughs> so I knocked on the uh, tent pole, and uh, he got up. All he had on was a pair of shorts. <laughs> no shoes, no, just a pair of shorts. And, uh, he got up and interviewed the first thing he wanted to know. He says, have you had any combat experience? I said, no, no, sir. He said, well, I've got a rifle platoon in the 2nd Battalion for you. And he said, report to the 2nd Battalion. So I went down and, excuse me, and reported to the 2nd Battalion. And I got a rifle platoon in uh, George Company, 3rd Platoon George Company. So uh, you, uh, you started training with that rifle yes, battalion at that time, uh, getting right, ready for right, further invasions? Right. Mm -hmm. We had a few replacements, uh, such as myself, uh, quite a few enlisted replacements, and uh, the rest were uh, combat veterans of uh, Guadalcanal and uh, Bougainville, most of them. They'd all spent time in Australia. and. Uh, my company commander was a uh, field commission on uh, Bougainville. He was a sergeant in Guadalcanal and uh, was commissioned in the field. He was the first lieutenant when I met him, uh, Joe Fournier, a fellow from northern Maine, right? Had relatives in Quebec. <laughs> and uh, he'd already been awarded a couple of silver stars, I believe, uh, his actions. And uh, he was a very uh, a good uh, company commander. A very, and uh, he uh, was quite uh, aggressive type of fellow. And uh, I, I really had a feeling that uh, he and Chesty Puller were of the same mind. They kind of loved to 
engage in combat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, your first trip, after that, you headed off to Peleliu, is that what it was? Yes, we, we went to Peleliu there in September. We landed on Peleliu September 15th. Right, September 15th. That's 40? 40, 44. Four. Let, let, me, let me back up just a little bit. Can you remember when you stood on that deck of that ship that morning, realizing that you were going to go ashore? Do you have do you have any remembrance of your feelings? Oh at that time? yeah, sure. We we stood on the deck and watched the the sunsets and the moon rises. Uh, we were 30 days aboard ship before we got to Peleliu. Uh, we were on a uh, uh, LST. Uh, we had our own. We had our Amtrak's. LVTs in the hold of the LST. We loaded them. I loaded them. I was a combat cargo officer on additional duty. I loaded everything aboard the ship. And of course, you had to load them in inverse order. The last out was <laughs> first out of last in. And, uh, but uh, we, we did a lot of thinking. And, uh, but at that time, I was. Uh, a young man, and uh, I'd seen a lot of movies, a lot of John Wayne movies, John Payne movies. <laughs> you remember those? And uh, we we were pretty uh, hot to go. Uh, the ones that had been in combat before were not quite as naive as those of us that hadn't been in combat, and uh, we we looked look forward forward to it actually and uh, of course some people have said that life was made so miserable for the Marines on Puvuvu that they were willing to go anywhere and fight anybody just to vent their their venom on <laughs> anyone they could get hold of uh, but uh, we were anxious to go and uh, uh, yeah I, I thought about you know well am I going to be alive tomorrow uh, the way I handled it is, I said, it's up to God. I, it's out of my hands. If I'm going to make it, I'll make it. If I'm not going to make it, I won't. Well, tell us about the invasion. Uh, we were in the, my platoon was in the first uh, wave, the assault wave. Uh, we were the first to hit the beach. We got on the LVTs in the hold of the LST. Then we drove the LVTs off the ramp in deep water about three miles out. And most of them floated. A few of them sunk. Because <laughs> they had to get the, get the fellas out of the water and put them in other ones. They lost a few LVTs. Not many. But, uh, and we churned our way in. And the reason we went in in LVTs was there was a reef about 700 yards off the beach that had to be crossed and we had to use tracked amphibious vehicles to cross that reef. We couldn't use the landing craft until they blew some holes in the reef to get them through. So we went on over the reef and on into the more shallow water and I'd say about uh, 200, 100 to 200 yards off the beach itself, we started receiving uh, enemy fire, machine gun fire. And uh, they were firing mortars at us. You could see the, the water spouts come up. And we continued on in. We embarked over the sides of the LVTs, who were the original LVTs before they had rear ramps. You had to climb over the sides to get out. And uh, we got out and under fire. Machine guns were still fired, pinging off the, the LVT. Ran across the beach and ran into a tank trap hole which the Japanese had put there and uh, to get under the machine gun fire. Well, we couldn't stay there long because they had mortar fire zeroed in on those tank traps and they started putting, as soon as we got in there, the mortars started coming down. So we had no choice but to go, go inland. Which we did, and we, I guess we went uh, pretty quickly after that on into the uh, edge of the airfield. Uh, 
we didn't go on the airfield. We stayed at the, the edge of it in a slightly wooded area, which was pretty well demolished by that time by naval gunfire, but there was still enough woods for some cover. And uh, we were held up there until they began to bring in the rest of the uh, units. Uh, our battalion was there, and there were battalions, assault battalions from the other regiments that were, were abreast of us. And uh, that was fairly uh, safe there for a while, and that afternoon, while we were consolidating our positions there, the Japanese decided to launch a tank attack against us. These tanks came from an administrative area that they'd been hiding in and crossed the airfield and came directly at our positions. Well, uh, between uh, artillery, uh, naval gunfire, and bazookas, most of the tanks were knocked out. But a few of them got through. One of them came right through my platoon area. And uh, uh, I think I mentioned this at the I thought that having been, uh, um, ha having had a lot of experience with Hollywood movies, I thought that I had a Thompson submachine gun. I thought I could get up in front of that tank and stop that tank with a Thompson <laughs> submachine gun <laughs> by getting, getting some bullets in the vents that they had to, to see through and for, for air. Well, the tank just came coming and I had to jump out of the way into a shell hole, and the tank went right by me, and right in back of us was an irrigation ditch of some kind. The tank went in the ditch and foundered and couldn't get out. And uh, we, uh, some of the occupants of the tank tried to climb out, and they were uh, killed as they did. But ammunition in the tank caught fire, because the tank had some uh, they were about, I don't know what the Japanese, they weren't 75 millimeter guns on the tanks. I think they were a little heavier than 37 millimeters. Well, anyway, the ammunition exploded all night in that tank. And uh, we stayed in that position for that night. And we took off again uh, the next morning and the offensive. I assume that there were no Japanese aircraft on the island at this time. Uh, I, not that I could see. But I did hear that there had been one or two planes that took off. So, but they were taken care of right away. Where, how did the how did the invasion go after that? Did you got to take the airstrip? Well, and I uh, the airstrip was taken. I, we moved up. We moved up to the north uh, west side of the airstrip, uh, on with heavy enemy opposition, and we didn't make much headway that next day. And the, uh, the next night, which was D plus one, uh, we got a lot of enemy fire, artillery and uh, mortar fire. And I got hit by the shrapnel from the mortar, mortar fire. And I was evacuated. And D plus one said the night of G plus one. I don't know whether it was before midnight or after midnight, I can't remember. And I went out to one of the, uh, AKAs, which had been converted into a hospital ship. They got rid of a lot of their cargo and they immediately converted into a hospital ship. And uh, we, uh, I, I didn't feel that I was wounded that seriously. So I stayed there that night. And uh, the next day, which would have been D plus two, uh, I told him I wanted to go back in, rejoin the outfit. And uh, no, you can't do it. Well, I talked to him into letting me go. And uh, there was an LCVP, which is a landing craft, uh, hull, hull type landing craft, uh, was going in for some reason or other. I don't know why. Anyway, they said the coxswain there said, You take me on into the beach. So, uh, he was a young fellow, about 18 years old, and I got in the landing craft, and we went into the beach. And on the way in, I saw a, uh, an LCI, which they had been converted into uh, rocket ships, uh, early introduction of rocket ships. 
and uh, it was firing rockets back at the Japanese positions. We passed by it about oh, about a hundred yards from it. And all of a sudden, the whole thing went up in the air, and that ship just cleared the water. It must have been ten feet out of the water, and then came down and went right down to the bottom. <laughs> so I, they must have hit a mine uh, off the beach there. So we went on in, and he dropped me off. I said, "Which? Uh, you know where you're going?" He says, "Not really." And uh, he said, well, that looks like a pretty good beach there. I said, okay. <laughs> Drop me off there. I got off at the beach. I didn't know where I was. Go by yourself. By myself, yeah. But there was a semblance of a road going across the island. So I figured if I got on that road and went across the island, I'd eventually run into it. I mean, it was north of where we'd landed, so our people must be up to that location now, or close to it. So I walked across, and I must have walked, uh, it was only three miles across the island, but I must have walked about half a mile, three quarters of a mile, and uh, I, I ran into our uh, battalion CP, uh, off to the south of where I was. And uh, I checked in with the battalion exec, and he said, where'd you come from? I said, I just came from that road up there. He says. Well, that's not ours. He says, that's Jap the Japanese hold that road. <laughs> I said, well, there's no Japanese there now because I just walked right across. Nobody bothered me at all on either side. I don't know where everybody was. I was wondering what happened to everybody. And uh, I said, well, where's, uh, where's my company? And he pointed out to me where the company was. So I went up and uh, rejoined uh, uh, Joe Fournier, the company commander, who was up at the... Uh, at the foot of uh, Hill 200, which was the original Bloody Nose Ridge, and uh, it was next to two next to 201. There was a ravine between 200 and 201, and the Japanese had uh, caves up in these coral ridges. They ran anywhere from 50 to 100 feet, 150 feet high, and over the, some of them were 200 feet high. They were coral ridges, and what they'd done is dug caves, and they had uh, field pieces that they'd run in and out of the caves on tracks, and uh, they'd come out and fire, and then they'd run them back in, and uh, you wouldn't know where they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, But there was a, a mountain gun, several machine gun emplacements, and some mortar emplacements, uh, enemy type, and uh, they had been trying, this was about noontime, I guess, and uh, they'd been trying to get up there and knock out those emplacements, and they hadn't been able to do it. And my company had been pretty well decimated trying to do that. The, uh, and so Joe Fournier told me, he said, I was the only officer. He lost all the other officers. He was the only one left. Uh, he said, you get a group of volunteers together and go up and see if you can get that mountain gun out. So uh, the distance between where we were then, our lines, and the mountain gun to the foot of the ridge was about 150 yards. And you had to go over a slight, uh, and uh, I guess you'd call it an escarpment. Uh, it was about 20 feet high to get to the foot of the, the ridge, the hill to 200. And uh, so I got six volunteers. That's all I could round up. And uh, I told them what we we're going to do. So I told them there was machine gun positions and mortar emplacements and a mountain gun up there that they're running in and out, and we had to go up and get it. And uh, the minute we went over this ledge, to work our way towards the foot of the, the hill and the ravine in between, uh, we were under fire, enemy fire. And they fired mortars at us and machine guns and everything. And by the time I got to the foot of the hill, there was only three of us left, myself and two men. Uh, and we had all sorts of dead Marines and on that open space in front of it from previous attempts to do it. So myself and uh, my BAR man, uh, we had 
quite a few hand grenades on our belts. And uh, we managed to throw, get a bit, claw away up about halfway up the hill. And I think I must have thrown about four or five hand grenades into that gun emplacement. And it stopped. And uh, there was a little ledge about halfway up the hill. So I stood on it, and my BAR man and one other man that I'd had with me, the three of us, I said, all right, now signal to the company commander that we're here, and I think the gun is knocked out. Tell him it's OK to come on up for the rest of the company. That's what he said he'd do. He said, if you get that gun out, you'd say, let me know, and I'll bring the rest of the company up. So we're up there signaling, exposing ourselves to the enemy at the same time. And nothing happens. And we could see down the whole, our front lines and everything, and where our troops were, and our equipment. And they brought some armored uh, LVTs up, LVTAs they called them. They were uh, landing vehicle, vehicles tracked, which they fitted with uh, 37 millimeter uh, guns. And uh, some of them had 75 millimeter guns on them. And uh, we're up there trying to signal to uh, Joe Fournier and the rest of the company, nothing happens, nobody's, nobody's coming up. And the next thing I know, the LVTAs are firing at us. So I said, we've got to get out of here. They, they think we're, we're Japs. They, uh, they don't. And, I found out later that Joe Fournier had not told anyone about his plan. He just told me to go up there and do it. And in his words, he said, you go up there and knock that gun out, and you've got a Navy Cross. So I said, boy, that's good. I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> I was dumb enough to <laughs> do it. And uh, so we knocked the gun out, but nothing happened then. So we inched our way around Hill 200 to the east side of it and found a place where we could work our way down. And we were about, uh, we could only get down to about, oh, about uh, 30 feet above ground level. And we had to drop from there. And we dropped the rest of the way down. And uh, so then I went around to try to find out where the company commander was. And I found him. He, the reason he didn't come up is he was laying there with the hole between his eyes and the back of his head blown out. So he must have started to come up and they got him right at the very beginning. So uh, by that time my leg wound was bleeding pretty much again. So the medic said, uh, you, better, uh, you better, better go back to the aid station. So they sent me back and they sent me on back, evacuated me. And the whole battalion was withdrawn, I think, the next day, what was left of it. Uh, the, the casualties were extremely high. There wasn't, we really didn't have, I don't think it could have made one good platoon out of the, the rest of the company that was there. How long did that whole campaign take? Well, the assault phase they declared over in nine days. Okay. But to clear out those ridges and the rest of the island took another month six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask uh, on the landing, when landing on the beach, uh, how heavy were the casualties at that time? They could probably... Quite, quite heavy. My, I was lucky. My platoon, I don't think we had more than half a dozen casualties on the beach in my platoon out of, uh, let's see, the platoon was three squads, 13 men each, 39 platoon sergeant, platoon guy on, about 42 of us in the platoon. So we lost about half a dozen on the beach. But some of them were, were much worse than that. Some of them were 50% casualties on, yeah. on the beach. So what did you do after this? Well, I went down to Guadalcanal and the hospital. And uh, the division, 1st Marine Division, was withdrawn after the assault phase after nine days, because there wasn't much of a division left. It was pretty beat up. And uh, the Army, 81st Wildcat Division, came in, which was, had been in reserve off the beach, in floating reserve. They came in and 
finished it off in the next month and the cleaning it up up to all the ridges and they, they were just Japanese positions under all of them. It was pretty tough. I understand going. you uh, learned about a kind of interesting relationship between, uh, say, MacArthur and Nimitz, the, the value of fellow. Yeah, well, of course, I didn't know anything about it at the time. It's just what I've read since. That MacArthur and Nimitz had a little, didn't get along too well together. Nimitz is, uh, they both had different ambitions, I guess, uh, on the strategic level. Nimitz wanted to be able to say that the Navy had conquered the Pacific, I guess, all the way up to Japan by taking all these islands. And uh, MacArthur, of course, was, uh, I think most people know the type of fellow he was, and he wanted to get all the glory for going back to the Philippines and then taking Japan. Uh, and he kind of uh, looked down on all this island hopping that Nimitz wanted to do. And I'm not sure which was best, you know. Anyway, it all worked out. <laughs> okay, so what did you do after Peleliu? Uh, after Peleliu, it was back to Pavuvu, where we got new replacements from the states. Rats and mud. Yeah, back to <laughs> the rat hole, the infested mud hole <laughs> with rats. Uh, and coconuts. I might mention coconuts. We had quite a few casualties from coconuts because it had been a coconut plantation. And uh, falling coconuts, you didn't dare go out without your steel helmet on. <laughs> and uh, we went back there, and this was October of 44. And uh, trained for Peleliu. For? I mean for Okinawa. Okay. Okinawa, which uh, they called it Love Day instead of D-Day, L-Day, uh, which was April 1st, 1945, April Fool's Day, 1945. And uh, we trained there from November through the time we embarked for, for Okinawa when we embarked around the we landed the 1st of April, uh, we embarked around the 1st of March. That was about a month's trip for it, wasn't it? Yeah. We were in the, at sea for 30 days before we landed on Okinawa. And what kind of a vessel were you on? We were on a regular uh, uh, troop transport at that time, an APA, which was a pretty nice, fairly comfortable ship compared to what we'd been on before. Okay. Uh, as you're getting ready to go into Okinawa. What kind of an, uh, what kind of resistance did you encounter as you started to go ashore? Well, we, my regiment, 1st Marine Regiment, we had a new commander. Jesse Puller had gone back to the States by that time. He'd been promoted to Colonel and uh, he'd been wounded at uh, Peleliu and he went on back to the States. We had a new regimental commander and a new battalion commander. And uh, in fact, our new battalion commander had, had not been in combat. <laughs> and uh, I looked at it a little differently, I think, going to Okinawa. I was the company uh, machine gun platoon leader and mortar section leader. And uh, I'd been promoted to first lieutenant and I'd been in combat. So I, I was sort of a different, uh, a sort of different frame of mind than I did when I a new second lieutenant going to combat for the first time. I knew that this wasn't a Hollywood movie, so <laughs> and uh, realized that it was a serious business. And uh, but we were in reserve, and the division, uh, the Seventh uh, Marine Regiment, and uh, what is the other one? The Fifth Marine Regiment. 5th Marines and 7th Marines were assault regiments. We were a reserve regiment. So we didn't go ashore at uh, 0600 as the uh, assault regiments did. We went ashore about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, about four hours later. And we went over the same beach as the 5th Marines had gone in on. And uh, 
they had adjusted their positions over and we went went in and sort of came up alongside them. That was a beach a blue, blue one. And uh, we ran into about, oh, right from the beach, inland from the beach, about half a mile. It was a, an airfield, Japanese airfield. It was called Yantan Airfield. It was north of the big airfield in Okinawa, which was uh, Kadena Airfield. Uh, and this L, this is an air, airfield that was mostly for fighter aircraft. And we got to the edge of the uh, airstrip, and we thought that all the planes, uh, we, we didn't run into any enemy activity at all. And uh, the first thing we get to the edge of the airstrip, and here comes the Japanese Zero down the airstrip, yeah. taking off. <laughs> and. Uh, as soon as it got airborne, why all the ships, any aircraft, started firing at it. And that's why we had our first casualties from friendly fire. <laughs> but, uh, and then we crossed the airfield, and we went directly across the island from west to east. And uh, we went out to a peninsula on the east side of the island. I think it was called Mot Motobu Peninsula. I'm not sure of the name, but it was a prominent peninsula. And it was it was very nice country there, and we only hit very light Japanese resistance along the way. Did you encounter many of the Okinawa civilians, and how did yes, they react? Yes. How did you react with them? There quite a few civilians, and uh, we we had not had any training at all in, that I knew of in how to deal with civilians. And uh, we weren't really ready for a large civilian. And we didn't know exactly what to do with them. And, uh, and we had been told that a lot of them were, were going to be Japanese soldiers posing as civilians. So we were quite uneasy about that. Uh, we didn't want to kill civilians. At the same time, we didn't know whether they were really civilians or not. And we were in no position to find out because it was too late to try to tell who's who's who. We're, we were there, and that's you're confronted with this situation right there in front of you. No well, we time. haven't solved that problem even with yeah. Iraq. Yet. No, no, that's right. And uh, but we did. Uh, we took care of it pretty well. We didn't. Uh, I think we did a pretty good job under the circumstances, and we tried to herded them. And if there were any of their villages left, we tried to leave them in their villages and just continue on. And uh, we went over to the uh, to that peninsula on the other side, and we my company was assigned uh, as security for uh, the regimental headquarters, uh, which was located. Uh, not too far from where we were. And we went across so fast that the communications then weren't as good as they are now. And uh, the first thing we knew, we were being attacked by our own aircraft who thought we were Japanese. <laughs> and uh, we had suffered quite a few casualties. Uh, the regimental headquarters, the CP command post, suffered quite a few casualties from it. And uh, I remember looking at the uh, Corsairs coming over, and we were watching them come in, and we thought, boy, they look nice. I'm glad they're on our side. Well, while we're looking at them, all of a sudden, the machine guns start going, and their bombs start coming at us. And uh, we, we jumped into holes as quickly as we could. And, and fortunately, we didn't have any casualties, but the regimental headquarters did. Well, they got that straightened out. And, and then we did, we went from there up to the northern part of Okinawa, did a lot of patrol work, finding scattered resistance and pockets of Japanese. Uh, they, they were no big problem and, until we were then called down. It was around the, let's see, we landed, I don't know whether I mentioned it, we landed uh, 
on April Fool's Day. And uh, about the 1st of May, we were called down to the southern part of the island to relieve an army division. I can't remember, I think it was the 27th Army Division, which had suffered heavily, heavy casualties uh, north of Naha, the city, the main city in Okinawa. And uh, so we, we relieved them on their lines. There wasn't much to relieve. Uh, we talked to the uh, regimental commander, he, and who was pretty much in a state of shock, and we didn't get much information from him. Told us where his troops, he thought they were, he didn't know where they were. Well, we found most of them, most of them were dead, <laughs> uh, on up further. So we just had to take off from there, and uh, we got ahead of him and let him pull his, what he had left back and go back, I don't know whatever happened to them. And uh, we hit some pretty heavy fighting there. We lost our company commander, uh, Joe Tuscorn, he was the captain. And uh, uh, he was killed on the, I think it was around the 4th of May. And, uh, and he was killed by the company exec took over as company commander and I took over as company exec. Uh, who was the CO? Uh, Joe Tuscornia that got killed. Mm -hmm. oh, no, excuse me, Ed Tuscornia. Ed Tuscornia. Joe Fournier said Peleliu. So that was the second company commander killed. <laughs> killed. And uh, so we tried to get further. We were on the outskirts of Nah, and we tried to get in closer, but we, we couldn't make it. The resistance was too heavy. We were suffering too many casualties. And we hit, had a lot of casualties there. And uh, so they withdraw, withdrew us from the front lines to a, a safe area where we could uh, reorganize and consolidate. And we got a whole bunch of replacements in. We got, I think we got four new second lieutenants in, just off the ship. Uh, Weren't you wounded on Okinawa? Yeah. That was uh, your second time? Yeah. And, uh, not, but not yet, I haven't got to that oh, point I'm yet. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse <laughs> me. Uh, we uh, got new officers and new men and most of them not too well trained. And uh, I tried, as a company exec, the first sergeant and I tried to process them through. We get all their names and all the information we needed on them, who they were, where they were assigned. We'd assign them to the various rifle platoons. And, uh, then we went on the attack again, north of the Shuri Castle, they call it, which was to the uh, east of Naha. It was a strong point. For the, it was their main strong point. And uh, we suffered a lot of casualties going there. And uh, we lost most of our new, new second lieutenants. Uh, and uh, we were just north of uh, Sherry Castle and the first sergeant and I were, we were pinned down actually. Our platoons, the rest of the platoon was pinned down. Uh, or the rifle platoons were pinned down. And uh, Walter Burke was then the company commander, and I was his exec. And uh, we set up a temporary CP in what we thought was a safe location. And we couldn't move forward for a while. So I was discussing uh, company administrative matters with the uh, first sergeant. We were in the shell hole. And, uh, you know, sitting alongside of each other, and that's the last I remembered. <laughs> He was hit by a shell, and uh, uh, I was sitting right next to him. I hardly got a scratch, and he was blown all over me. <laughs> and they told me. I do remember a guy, some fellow shouting, uh, this, this guy's still alive. <laughs> that was me. The next thing I knew, I was in an aid station. Well, I couldn't even walk straight for a couple of weeks, concussion. And uh, everything was spinning and uh, so I was evacuated to uh, Guam and uh, about uh, two weeks later why the, the assault phase of that battle was over too. So it was over around 
would have made about the 1st of June. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, why the, uh, we were under the command of the 10th Army, uh, General uh, uh, Buckner was commanding general, and he was killed uh, about a week after I was evacuated. And uh, our, comp our division commander was uh, uh, Major General uh, Pedro Del Valle, and uh, he made it all right. And uh, I was sent back to the States, and uh, the division, after that, I found I was sent to Japan and China. Elements were sent to Japan, elements were sent to China after the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs were dropped. And Who actually, were you when you heard of Nagasaki? I, mean, I, was, I was in a bar in Brooklyn. In a bar? In, that sounds like a good place. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. uh, we, we're about to wrap up here. Do you f tell us what impact you feel that your com combat experience or your experiences in World War II have affected you? How has your life been affected by that whole event? Well, I, <clears throat> the one thing I was uh, offered a regular commission uh, from Peleliu, which I accepted, so I decided to stay in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, if it had not been for the war, I'd, I doubt if I'd have ever uh, stayed in the service. And my, my aim in life was to be a history college history professor and uh, so it changed the direction of my life completely uh, the fact that we'd been there did you use a GI bill uh, when I retired I used it when you retired yeah okay. to go to school and I, I also used it to buy a house in California mm -hmm. VA loan when I was stationed out there well we're about to run out here. Is there anything, any event that we have failed to ask you about that you think we should be, we should discuss? Well, no, other than the fact that it was uh, quite an experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, anyone else have a question? Oh, uh, no, we, they we, have to have to go through yeah, the we just spelling have, well, of the island. <laughs> well, George, we, we certainly appreciate you meeting with us, and we hope that maybe some historian in 300 years <laughs> that wants to know about Peleliu or Okinawa will be able to come and retrieve this. We certainly appreciate your interview, and we appreciate what you did for our country. Well, thank you. I appreciate your having asked me here.